Let's see if we can make this work. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to uh, Elgin Free Church. I'm, my name's Brian. I'm the, one of the ministers here. Uh, if you, of course, pick up a welcome packet if, or pick up the service sheet as you came in. Uh, if you're new and haven't connected with us, you can connect online. Uh, the welcome packets in the, in the lobby are also, there's some good information in there. And of course, uh, connect with us online. Stay around after, after the service. We have a, a lovely coffee and fellowship time. In the, in the service sheet, uh, there's, a, there's an insert, family news. Uh, we're continuing the Easter break, so a lot of the normal activities, we're, uh, we're taking a, a respite from those. But invite you all to join. Uh, we have a joint service every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock in Berghead. So uh, invite you for that. Peter will be preaching on the, uh, on the prophecy of Joel. Again, that's one of those little books that uh, you almost, in the Old Testament, minor prophets that you almost turn past. But, uh, but Peter has had a wonderful series uh, on that. Um, there's no, so there's no midweek prayer. Small groups in two weeks. Two weeks we'll resume the small groups. In the, the only thing I want to draw your attention to on the back of the sheet, uh, on the left-hand side, there's, there's some highlighted opportunities for membership. You can read about that. But the one I want to point out is the congregational meeting. At, at the end of the month, the 24th, uh, there's a congregational meeting. More information on that will be coming. There's, there's some information here that, that uh, you can look at when, we, when you get home. But uh, those are uh, very, very important uh, just activities within the, I know we just had one. This is a called meeting for a specific, for a specific purpose. So uh, again, we'll be giving you more information on that as the date uh, gets closer. But I just want to want you to kind of a, save the date on, on that. Um, anyway, please take these home, read about it this afternoon, and address any questions to either myself or, or to Peter. Our contact information is, is on the uh, church family news. So now we can, uh, time we can set aside our cares and come into the presence of the living God to worship him and to honor him. Our, for our call to worship, I'm taking from Psalm 22, that, that, that great messianic psalm, which says, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. We have an opportunity now to, to sing to, to this God, the the, uh, the God who rules over the nations and the band will lead us as we sing to the one to whom angels worship and yet he sets his love on the sons of men. Please stand as you're able and join as the musicians lead us in our opening song, I Cannot Tell.
please be seated. So, as we, as we come to God to worship, it's appropriate for us to consider, are we allowed to do this? Are we, we worship a holy God, and it's appropriate to remind ourselves of that fact, to take some time now for, we want to take some time now for confession and to seek God's mercy. I'm going to borrow the catechism question that's in the bulletin or the service sheet for this purpose. Uh, we actually have something else for the children's address, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first, I want to take some time to look at the Q&A, uh, the question and answer, the catechism question, which is a question catechism number 14. Did God create us unable to keep his law? And so it's in response to the idea that we are required to keep the law of God, but we fail to do so. And so the question is very specific. Did he create us this way? Are we just the victims of our circumstances? And the answer is no. He did not create us unable to keep his law. But because of the disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all creation is fallen. It's, it's broken. We are all born in sin and guilt, corrupt in our nature, and unable to keep God's law. That is, that is the human condition that we find ourselves in. We live in a world that's broken, and uh, it's certainly not as bad as it could be, but there's nothing in the creation that we can see and sense that is not touched by by the fall. And so, as we come to God, we, we find that we are, we are required to keep the law, but we're unable to keep God's law. And until we come to grips with that fact, we'll never grasp our need as a, of a Savior. So, let's uh, take a moment, let's go to God, confessing our need of that Savior, and thanking God for that provision. Let's pray. Take a moment now, Lord, to bring our sins personally before you. And Father, if our problem was ignorance, Jesus would have come, perhaps as a professor, to give us knowledge. If our problem was some psychological imbalance, Jesus would have come to provide counseling as a counselor. If our problem was unjust laws, Jesus would have come as a lawyer or a politician. If our problem was the violence of bad people, Jesus would have come as a policeman or perhaps as a general at the head of an army. But Father, our problem is, is sin. We are born with it. Our hearts incline towards it. No one ever had to teach a toddler to disobey or be selfish. At the youngest age, we start out, Lord, hardwired to go to disobey, and we never stop. We're certainly not as bad as we could be, it's, that's true, but we fall short of your glory. That's the standard. And we are incapable, Lord, of meeting it. And so we need, we need a Savior. It's our desperate need, Lord. Help us to see it. Help us to embrace it, most importantly. Help us to come to the only one, to Jesus, the only one who can meet that need. Father, we plead with you to forgive our sins, to make us able and capable of coming and worshiping you. Help us to desire you and then fill us with that desire. Lord, we thank you that you have provided all we need in Jesus for this world and for the world to come. We praise you, I praise you, Lord, for every soul that's here, for everyone who may be listening. I pray that you would shower your love upon us today. And it's in Jesus' name that we make this prayer. 
Amen. Amen. I would like to ask the, the two children and any other children that uh, find themselves here, could you guys come up and would you do me a favor and come up and sit in that front row there? Go ahead. Now, we have a treat for you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite here in a minute, I'm going to invite Miss Catherine, who normally you just see her, and she's playing the piano over there and making beautiful music, but uh, she has a reading for us today, and I think you all will, uh, I think you all get a thrill out of it. This is a genuine Doric reading of the, uh, the resurrection story, and it's an accent that you're going to have a little trouble maybe, but, uh, and it's not one that we hear very much anymore. <laughs> it's not an accent that we hear very much anymore, but listen closely, and uh, I think you'll get this soon. <coughs> I like springtime when clumps of snowdrops, crocus, and daffodils all come alive from the dead earth. The reading in Scotch verse, the first Easter, Mary meeting our risen Lord. The streets was dark and empty in the oor afore the dawn. Nobody heard her leave the house nor saw for she was gone. Nobody saw her tack the path that climbed the stainy slope to the garden far they had laid him, numb with grief, bereft of hope. She had often heard his teaching as she sat at Jesus' feet, but knew his promises seemed empty, and the future was calm and bleak. But there was one last thing he did for the master she adored, and she carried spices and oils for the body of her Lord. By the time she reached the garden, the eastern sky was grey and the morning star was rising in the threshold of the day. At the grave she stood. She was dumbfounded, for the tomb was lying empty, and the stain was rolled away. She ran back down the steamy path through the early morning tune. She could hardly speak for sobbing when she reached the upper room. All right, my love, said Peter, talk your time and tell us all again. We've seen the Lord of all, she sobbed. Far his art, I dinna ken. All of all and see if it's happened. Peter took her by the hand. John already had his coat on. Come on, Peter, if you're gone. John and Peter, fierce and puzzled, stood inside the empty tomb. They could see the grave clays lying in a heap upon the floor. Peter stooped and lifted the head cloth. I think sure. There's nobody here. So sad and tired, the twa disciples made their way back down the hill. Mary begged there by herself, by the graveside, softly greeting. Suddenly, twa shining angels appeared in the empty tomb. Woman, tell us, why are you greeting? Mary looked up in fear. Because we've taken away my master, and I didn't came far till. Then Mary turned 
and she saw a stranger standing on the hill. Lassie, tell me, why are you greeting? Gently came the stranger's word. Please, sir, if you have moved him, tell me, where have you put my lord? Mary kindly spoke the stranger, just a word, and she knew he had won the final victory. All his promises were true. Master, joyfully she wept him, and she fell and clasped his feet. She would gone and tell the others that she had met the risen Lord. Dinna hurt me yet, said Jesus, for I'll hae to gang awa to my father and your father, to my God and yours and all. The morning shone, the morning sun shone brightly as she walked back down the hill. The little birds sang sweetly and Mary sang a tune as well sang for the sunshine in her hair and for all she'd seen and heard on that foremost Easter morning when she met the risen Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's amazing. Let me, uh, let me say a prayer and I'll dismiss you guys. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word and that story, Lord, no matter how it's read, it thrills us. It is, a, it is the most exciting story um, in history. It's a pivotal point of, of our world's history. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for all, all these little ones and grown-up little ones who could sit in here. Father, bless this reading to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, you're dismissed. And I believe, yeah, Sharon will help you and teach you. Good. Well, again, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, That really knocked me off my stride. I got to figure, figure out where I'm at here. Uh, the band will lead us, right? The band will lead us now uh, in Psalm, uh, Psalm 104. This is a psalm concerning the Lord's glory. May the Lord's majestic glory always last and never fade. Please stand and we'll, we'll sing. <laughs>
And now I'll, I will ask uh, Stuart to, to come and give our reading for today, after which Gavin will come and lead us in prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking. <coughs> they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus Himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing Him. He asked them. What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked them, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but couldn't find his body. They came and told us that I had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not their hearts burning within us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Amen. Let's join together as we come before our holy God. (coughs) Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning humbly before you, a righteous God who is awesome, mighty and just, but also merciful and gracious, loving and compassionate. Lord, there is so much in our world to pray for at this time. We pray for all those afflicted by conflict, famine or natural disasters, whether physically or mentally distressed, bereaved or displaced. May each be comforted by your presence and come to know the hope and peace that can only be found in knowing you. We pray that you would speak peace into the ongoing crisis in Israel and Gaza. Father, please provide food, clean water, medical supplies and necessities for all those affected by current events. Thank you for the selfless work of all the aid agencies, often working in hostile conditions to bring comfort and relief to those most affected by the conflict. We particularly remember those aid workers from the World Central Kitchen that sadly lost their lives this week and pray that you would comfort those they have left behind. Give world leaders wisdom as they handle this situation. Guide our hearts and minds as we pray. Open our eyes to those who grieve in our churches and communities and help us to comfort them. We also remember Taiwan at this time 
and pray for the families of those who have died as a result of the recent earthquake. We pray for the quick recovery of those who remain trapped, that there would be no more damage or loss of life, that rebuilding would go smoothly and quickly, and that you would use all this for your glory. Lord, we bring before you our congregation here in Elgin and ask you to bless us and fill us with your spirit. We may feel tired and discouraged at times, so we pray for your power and protection against the attacks of the enemy. Know that you are our refuge and our strength an ever-present help in times of trouble. We pray for all our leaders this week, for those preparing sermons, Sunday school lessons or worship programs, that their hearts and minds would be directed towards Christ. We pray for all who serve, whether that be cleaning, providing refreshments, working the sound system and computers, welcoming, playing music, and many other roles. Encourage us all and give us joyful servant hearts, we pray. Father, this week, give us opportunity and boldness to speak of you in our communities, inviting friends, family, and work colleagues to come and hear about the real meaning of life that is to be found in you. Lord, grow this church, we pray, and make us a light shining out in the darkness of this city, leading many to you. We pray for those of our number who are unable to meet with us, whether it be in health or circumstance. God of all healing and comfort, we remember and bring before you all who need to feel your presence and peace at this time. Lord, you know and care for each and every one of these people. So we would pray that you draw near to them, restore them, and meet them where their need is greatest. Lord, we ask your blessing on the remainder of the service and on Brian as he brings your word to us. Just as with those disciples on the road to Emmaus, may our hearts burn within us as we learn more of you. And may we be challenged by what you have to say to each of us this morning. We pray all these things in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And in our final preparation for hearing God's word, I'd ask Leslie to come. She'll be leading us in Psalm 25. This is a psalm. Uh, where the psalmist is crying out to God. He says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. So please stand and we'll, we'll join in singing.
I will invite you to uh, open your Bibles, if they're not open already, to our passage, Luke 24, that's found in, on page 1061, I think that's right, yes, 1061 in the, uh, the Bibles in the pew. Let me just get out my spectacles here. You know, they fall, they fall down wrong in the pocket, and they're just jammed in there. This will be a good time for you to make your way to that passage. Boy, this is, this is embarrassing. <laughs> All right, this is going to be a two-handed job here. I have a choice, I guess, of tearing my pocket or, uh, or being able to see the print. This makes for uh, this makes for good internet right now. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this will, this will, uh, okay, almost got it. Whew. There we go. Now I can see. Uh, so, Psalm or Psalm, Luke chapter twenty-four. Um, our Is our passage uh, we'll be reading? Uh, well, we, Stuart has already read from verses 13 through 35, and in in the gospel here, it's still it's still Easter Sunday. This is uh, we 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 read, of course, last week of the resurrection itself and the the empty tomb, and there there's a lot that has been happening since dawn. That was at dawn, uh, but. And the other gospel writers sort of cover different things. Uh, but Luke sticks with, Luke, Luke just kind of leaves the rest of the day. And we, we kind of fast forward to the afternoon. So it's late afternoon. It's maybe 4 o'clock or so. And uh, the, we, we zoom in on, on two disciples. These aren't apostles. These are just two disciples. One of them, we learn his name is Cleopas, uh, it's possible that it's a, a husband and wife team. There's a there's a Clopa, there's a Mary, the wife of Clopas that's mentioned in John at the at the cross. Could be that couple. Could be just another Clopas and a, and another disciple. We don't know. Uh, but but they're on a on a they're walking home to a little village that's a seven mile walk from Jerusalem. So uh, they're about a two hour journey. It's called Emmaus. And uh, they're kind of processing the events of the day and probably by extension the last three years and beyond. And, and you can see in your notes, in your, in your service sheet, there's a place there for taking notes if you like. They're, they're talking it out. Uh, Jesus joins them, but they don't know it's him. And he begins talking them to them, he begins talking to them, and at that point they begin taking it all in, taking in the things that Jesus is saying, and then finally he reveals himself to them, and they just can't control themselves. They have to tell it around. So as we follow the narrative, we're going to discover how Jesus relates to us and what we're going to and what we should do about it. So first let's open, let's pray. Open our eyes, O oh Lord. Help us to see wondrous things from your word. Father, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So, unmet expectations. When our oldest was just a little boy, maybe five years old, uh, he somehow got it into his head that he was going to get a pony for Christmas. That, that Santa Claus had promised him a pony he, for Christmas, and no amount of, of reason. We, we, we talked to him. Uh, we, said, we said, Josh, uh, Josh, it, uh, we don't have, we can't fit a pony in our, in our backyard, and, and there's no place for him to stay. And no matter what we came up with, well, he could stay in the, in the garage. 
no, that's, that's, that's for the car. Uh, and, and it's not really, it's not set up for a, for a pony. And he was just, but he, he, he was convinced no amount of reasoning would change his mind. And it even got to the point where on Christmas morning, he jumped out of bed, ran to the garage where he, you know, he had planned to put the pony there, threw open the door, no pony. It was, I mean, it still kind of breaks our heart to, uh, well, I mean, it breaks, you, if you could see Cheryl now there, she's got her sad face on it. it but it was, it, was, it was so upsetting that no amount of reason would dissuade him from this, frankly, un, unreasonable conclusion that he'd come to. And uh, when it's, you know, when it's, when it's the things with, with Santa Claus, they tend to be self-correcting. But um, when it comes to God, if we get wrong ideas about God and, and his nature and what he can and can't and will and won't do for us, if we get the wrong ideas, it's imperative that those be corrected. And the process of that correction involves an interplay between God's sovereignty on the one hand and our responsibility on the other hand. So, so as, we, as we, we talk it out, we take it in, we talk it around in response to God coming to us, God opening his word, and God opening our eyes. So, so let's begin. Our, our first point is the disciples talking it out. They're, they're headed to a village called Emmaus. And as I said, it's, it's about, it's, the scriptures tell us it's seven miles. So that's about a two-hour journey for, for people in those days. Uh, it says in verse 14, they were, they were talking about everything. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. I th I, and I think it's more than just the events of the day, the empty tomb. I think they're talking about probably the last three days, right? Starting, starting with the empty tomb, of course, but, but going back uh, three days, the, the horror of the crucifixion, the, the, all the things that happened, the darkened sky, the earthquake, the, uh, the tombs opening up. Uh, John tells us about tombs opening up and, and dead people coming out of the tombs and, and walking around and being seen, about the curtain being torn in two and Jesus crying out on the cross, uh, the trial, the trial, mock trial, if you will, leading up to the crucifixion. Uh, they might have gone on to talk about the, the previous week, right? The, the Jesus coming in that, that incredible procession as he comes into Jerusalem or, or his cleansing of the temple. Boy, that was something, overturning the tables in the temple. Um, his sermon on the Mount of Olives where he, he, he has this long sermon about the end times and and wars and rumors of wars and the sky turning black and then just the I mean the heavens and the earth being shaken the destruction of Jerusalem all of these things they're talking about and then a guy comes up along and says hey what are you talking about now we might find this strange as we're walking along some random fellow comes up uh, and cuts into our conversation but in those days, and really until very recently, conversations on the street, that's how you caught up on the news, right? You're, you're, you're all walking, so, so you don't pass each other like on a dual carriageway where you just kind of, kind of blow past. As you know, you're, you're walking, the other person's walking, and so there's some time where you're within earshot of each other, and if two people are talking, you're going to, you're going to, pick up on, on at least the gist of, of what they're doing. So, you know, people walking along the road would tend to kind of group up, kind of sort of Canterbury Tales style. And, and you, you, you make these little, little clusters and, and so you talk. That was the internet of the day, if, if you will. You, you talk about what was going on. So it wasn't the interruption, that this, this stranger's interruption that, uh, that, 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 that caused them to stop. Th their reaction it was it was a fact it was his <laughs> colossal ignorance uh, you know he, here's a fellow comes up and says hey what are y'all talking about and it's they can't they can't believe it they they said they stood still they just stopped right they're they're chucking along the road and they just stop they can't they can't believe this fellow it, i guess it's, it would be sort of like <clears throat> 
all the football fans here will remember that 2010, uh, the, the World Cup finals were in Johannesburg, right, South Africa. And on, on July 11th, as I recall, and so it would kind of be like on July 12th in Johannesburg, if you were to come up to somebody on the street and be totally clueless that that Spain had defeated the Netherlands 1-0, right? It was, a, it was an exciting game. It's all anybody anywhere on Johannesburg is talking about. And if you knew nothing about it, they would really kind of look at you very strange. So that's, that's their reaction. Like, are, are you, the, the, um, actually they, they say in verse 17, uh, it's kind of an unfortunate uh, uh, translation because it makes it, are, well, are you the only visitor? Or it could also be, are you, are, you, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Or it could also be, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem that you don't know these things that have happened in these days? Uh, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on in Jerusalem? Now, I have the, the, the dubious uh, distinction, a, a major life event, in the, a few months ago, I saw my first uh, beautiful, your pantomime. So I have been introduced to the fine art of English art of, of pantomime, and uh, I'm going to say something I never thought that I would say when I when I saw that. There's almost a pantomime going on here. Uh, th this this is kind of a biblical example. I think Luke expects us as we're reading this. To kind of be like the like the kids, you know, when the villain comes up and 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 uh, the the main characters talking and looking around, totally unaware, and you know how the kids, he's right behind you, there he is. I think that's kind of what Luke expects us to do here, because it's Jesus that that comes up, but and and, and I I think I think he's I think Jesus is kind of kind of having some some fun with uh, with it. It, but it's not silly fun. It's, it's fun with a purpose because it says, verse 16, it says very specifically, they were kept from recognizing him. This is not just he wasn't wearing a silly disguise or something. This is, a, this is an intentional act of God to keep them from recognizing him. And I, I, I think God sovereignly, intentionally, kept them from recognizing him, and we'll, and we'll see why. As Jesus asked them, he, so he says, verse 19, what things? And they just start in and, and unload, right? About Jesus of Nazareth, that he was a, the, the uh, he, and of course, they're, they're still going, and we're, we're still going, Jesus of Nazareth, that's him, that's him, that's the one you're talking to. But Jesus just lets them keep going, they keep talking it out. Right? He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And, and, and by the way, we, we tend to kind of wrinkle our nose uh, as, as New Testament people when, when we hear people talk about Jesus as a prophet. Right? We, we react and we, we say, well, Jesus is more than a prophet. Yes, he's more than a prophet, but he's not less than a prophet. He was, in fact, the fulfillment of all that a prophet would be. And we, we have to remember, a prophet was a big deal in Israel. Uh, a prophet was one who spoke from God, who spoke the very words of God. And at this time in Israel, God had been silent for 400 years. The, the last prophet was, was Malachi, and now, of course, John the Baptist is a, is a prophet, and, and he's beginning to speak. So people are, are excited about the idea of a prophet, people are hungry. And when Jesus comes along, here comes a prophet. And this man spoke the word of God. He wasn't like their rabbis, we hear again and again. He wasn't like, he wasn't the, you know, always quoting and referencing and footnoting everything he said. He spoke, it said, with authority. He spoke the word of God. And so, and, and he did more than that. He did more than just speak and talk. He he healed people, right? He made lame people walk. He, men born blind had their sight restored. He, he calmed storms by talking to them, saying, stop, 
he took a small basket of morsel of morsels of food and fed thousands of people. This, this man was a prophet like no other before, but he was indeed a prophet. And so uh, they go on to tell about his trial and his death, the fact that his body can't be found. Right now they don't, they don't, they can't bring themselves to say the R word. They can't talk about resurrection. It, resurrection just doesn't seem to be in their lexicon, but, but they're just going on and on, and he lets them. He lets them exhaust their grief and, frankly, their ignorance. They just, it's kind of like they have this big bucket of facts, like a bucket of Legos, and they just dump them on the floor, but they're utterly incapable of assembling them into a, into a conclusion until Jesus steps in there in verse 20, verse 25, he, uh, he puts a rather abrupt stop to their talking, their, this talking it out. He's actually, he's actually kind of rude to them. He calls them fools. How foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, foolishness, I think we've said this before, foolishness is not an intellectual category in scripture. Uh, foolishness in scripture has to, is a moral category. It has to do uh, with, with some moral failure, and, the, and their moral failure is that they are slow to believe what the prophets had said, what the scriptures have said. They are slow to believe what they should have been eating up. The, the, the prophets, that is, that's kind of Jesus' shorthand for the scriptures, have given, he's telling them, the prophets have given you all piles of data and you just didn't believe it. And all this time, Jesus is continuing to hide himself. And I have to say, sometimes God does that to us, doesn't he? He, he hides himself in order to more fully reveal himself. He wants us, I think, that, I think it's that he wants us at the place that the only thing we have left is him. We look at our lives, nothing makes sense. We say, God, where are you? And the, whole, and the truth is, he's there the whole time, but he stayed silent. He hasn't revealed himself. He lets us unload all we have. We come to the end of ourselves. And it seems kind of mean at, at first glance, but when we get through it, and, w- and when we're in it, it feels awful. It feels like we can't bear it. But, and, and, I want to urge you, if you do, if you find yourself in a situation like that where you just can't go on, you have to. You have to keep going on because once you've gone on and you've gotten beyond yourself, that's when Jesus can start sharing himself with you. And that's what he has to share. He has to share himself. So, so up to now, he's, he's hidden himself. And now he's going to share himself. And while they're, they've been talking it out, now they're going to take it in. And after his initial rebuke there in verse, in verse 25, he goes on and he keeps, he, he keeps laying into them. Verse 26, he says, Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Now, now you've probably noticed that in, in the Bible when when people ask a rhetorical question, this is a rhetorical question, didn't the, didn't the Messiah have to suffer and then enter into his glory? It was, it was a rhetorical, it was a device in those days, of, it was a way, a polite way of making a definitive statement. So it's not really a question like we would, he's not asking for an answer, he's giving them the answer, and actually it's a little, it's easier in the Greek because the Greek, in the Greek, the way the question is presented, you know what the answer is supposed to be. In our case, though, we, of course, we, we want to say the answer is obviously yes. The Messiah, that's the answer he expects. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter it into his glory? That's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, all of this had to happen just the way it did. He had to suffer. And then he had to enter his glory. That's the way it's always meant to work. That's what Jesus is telling them. And then he goes on to say in, in, in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, 
he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Again, Moses and the prophets is a shorthand for all the scriptures. And of course, all the scriptures meaning, meaning this part, right? The Old Testament. He went back into the Old Testament. And, and I suppose he started maybe in, I, I don't know, I suppose he started in Genesis 3 maybe, uh, where, where the God curses the serpent and he says, I'll put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. And he said, the seed of the woman, that's a, it's a singular feminine. So, so, for instance, the virgin birth would fulfill that prophecy. The seed of the woman, that the serpent would bruise his heel, would crush his heel. He would, the serpent, that the Satan would inflict a crippling blow on the seed of the woman. But the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. The seed of the woman would inflict a final fatal death blow on the serpent. So he starts, I suppose he started there. And then as people spread abroad on the earth, God narrowed down among all the people on the earth. He narrowed down where the Messiah would come from. And he gave a promise to this fellow named Abraham there in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. All, that in his seed, all the earth would be blessed. And as Abraham's offspring grew, God kept selectively eliminating possibilities of, of whose line the Messiah would, would come through. So it was going to come from Isaac and not Ishmael. It was going to come from Jacob and not Esau. It was going to come from Judah and not any of the other 11 sons of Jacob. So, and then, of course, his people were in bondage in Egypt. And he brought them out of bondage in Egypt as a picture of what salvation would look like. And then as he said, they're wandering in the wilderness, he gave, them, he gave them all of these laws. He gave them the temple, and he gave them the priesthood, and the sacrifices, and, and the, the rituals, and the incense, and all of those things point to Jesus. The bells, and the curtains, and the blood, and the smoke, and the pleasing aroma, the prohibitions against touching, all of those point to Jesus. And he ends up making a covenant with David that the Messiah would be his offspring and would sit on his throne forever. And David in the spirit puts words of suffering into the mouth of the Messiah. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or Psalm 116, the snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol lay hold on me. Or Psalm 31, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then, of course, the prophets come along. Isaiah, he was despised. He was rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes we are healed. All of these things. What a Bible study that must have been on that, on that walk. I often, uh, I'm often asked by people in other faith, Christian faith traditions. Why do you all spend so much time in the Old Testament? Aren't we supposed to be a New Testament church? And, and of, of course that's true. We are a church of the New Testament, but you can't understand the New Testament fully unless you understand the Old Testament. Jesus is to be found in the Old Testament. That's where the New Testament church found him. Again and again, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, it says they went to the scriptures. And that's, again, that's this. That's this, that's this Old Testament. That's the scriptures they had. Now, don't get me wrong. The New Testament opens up. He opens up Jesus in ways that the Old Testament, did I say that right? The New Testament shows us Jesus in ways that the Old Testament couldn't. And it helps us to more fully see who God is and, and what he did. But, it, but if you just read the New Testament, I, it's kind of like watching the movie and not reading the book. There, there's just there's things they can't put in it. And even if the movie's well done, uh, you're just going to miss some things. Can you live a fruitful life, pleasing to God, with just the New Testament? Sure you can. Sure you can. The, the, the persecuted church, we have, we have brothers and sisters in the world today who 
sometimes all they can do is they have to make do with scraps of scripture. That's all they can get their hands on at any one time. And, and, and God reveals himself, absolutely reveals himself through that. But you and I are not in that situation. We've got the whole word of God. We've got the entire word of God. And, and it's not just a privilege and a right and a joy. It's a responsibility to study the entire counsel of God, all of his word, hearing it and doing it. And of course, the blessing will be, will be incredible. And, and these, guys, these guys felt the blessing. Right? This, this two-hour Bible study was just getting started, and they reached their destination. And, and it, says, it says they begged him, please, please, they said, stay with us. Verses, uh, verses 28 and 29. Now, it looked as though, it looks as though Jesus is maybe going to go on. And again, the translation in verse, in verse 28 is a, a, a little unfortunate. It says Jesus continued on as if he were, he were going further. Uh, I, I, but it would be more accurate. It would be accurate to translate verse 28 as Jesus intended to continue his journey. Right? It was his intention. Uh, he wasn't trying to, he wasn't playing with them, trying to fool them. And in verse 29, it says, they urged him strongly. Now that, that verb that says they urged him strongly, that only appears, Luke uses it, actually. It only appears one other place in the New Testament. It's used by Luke in Acts chapter 16, where, where it said that Lydia, the, uh, the, and she was a seller of, she was a distributor. She was a high-end salesperson in, uh, in Philippi, and she prevailed upon Paul and Silas to stay, to stay with them. Uh, and other translations use the word persuade, urge, constrained, insisted. Uh, I like the message. The message says, puts it this way, we hesitated, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. So that's what these guys are doing with Jesus. They, Jesus, they, they want him to stay with them, and they won't take no for an answer. And... Uh, Again, Alistair Begg is of the opinion that Jesus would have gone on if they hadn't have asked. And, and his point is that Jesus wants us to want him. He will keep us at arm's length until we prove to him and to ourselves just how much we need him. He wants us to want him. Jesus is not a big fan of the aloof, independent, casual Christian. Uh, Jesus wants us to come to God as children, not as cats. Nothing wrong with cats, I suppose, but if that's our way of approaching Jesus, that's not what he wants. He wants us to approach him as vulnerable, as excited, as without shame. None of those things describe a cat when you come home to him. Uh, that's, that's more like your dog when you come home, right? And honestly, it, it, always, it always brings tears to my eyes when I, when I see those videos of, of a soldier coming home from, from deployment and showing up when his children don't expect him. Maybe he shows up in their classroom or something. And, and uh, there, there's that first that moment of bewilderment. And then, and then the child just screams out, Daddy! And it doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl. There's, there's no struggle to be cool. They just, they just lose it, and they rush headlong, and they bury their face in Daddy's shoulder, and they laugh, and they cry all at once. That's what Jesus wants from us. No need to be cool. There's no face left to, shave, left to save. Just, just collapse on his shoulder as he stoops down to embrace us. And that's kind of what he does in the, the big reveal. He sits down with them in their home, and, and he, he actually breaks protocol slightly. Um, uh, verse, verse 30, it says he was, he was at table with them. He took bread and, and gave thanks. Now, normally, the homeowner would play the role of the host and serve the bread, but Jesus seems to have taken the initiative to, to play that part. Uh, and it, it's not a reenactment of the Lord's Supper. These two, according to the Gospels, these two were not, were not at the Lord's Supper. So, uh, but w there was something, whatever it was, maybe, maybe they were reminded of him giving thanks and breaking bread in the feeding of the 5,000. Whatever it was, 
there they recognized Jesus when he, when he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. So again, verse 31, that verse 31 balances God's, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. They, they recognized him. Their eyes were open, right? That's a sovereign act of God. Their eyes were open, verse 31, and they recognized him. That's man's response, our response to God's sovereignty. Jesus delights to show himself to his people and to respond to them. And when that happens, we can't help talking it around. Uh, so the first thing they do, first thing they talk to each other, right? They, 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 they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? Now, I have to say, I, I, I have to admit, I probably would have been fixated on the fact that he just disappeared right in front of me. I, that was, that's pretty amazing. Um, uh, that I, I, I probably would have turned to my companion. Was that awesome or what? what did he, how did he do that? Right? Messiah's got superpowers and uh, the resurrection body just disappears. We're going to get bodies like that in the resurrection. Maybe, maybe I'll be able to disappear too. Uh, now, all those things are true, but that's not what captures them. It's not, the, it's not the stuff and the benefits. It's the word of God. Verse 32, weren't, weren't our hearts burning when he talked to us? And he opened the scriptures to us. Our hearts burn, they said. And, I, and obviously when your hearts are burning, nothing's too hard. Verse 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. <laughs> it, was, it was evening. They just walked seven miles to Emmaus. Without a second thought, up they go, slip the sandals back on and <coughs> make like a tree and leave. And they hightail it seven miles back to Jerusalem. And it says they found the eleven and those who were with them. Uh, so, so they found what was left of the inner circle of, of the other disciples. But again, it, it's, it's, it's kind of funny how all this, how all this happens. They, these, two, these two burst into the room, right, they, with, with their big reveal, and they've just, they've just done two 10Ks back to back, right? So they're all excited, and they burst into the room. I'm, I'm, sure, that the, I'm sure the trip back to Jerusalem didn't take two hours but the verse 33 and 34 there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and they were saying the 11 were saying it's true the Lord has risen has appeared to Satan right? or Satan oh my goodness has appeared to Simon um, I kind of feel for these two they've, they've hiked all the way back to Emmaus again didn't take them uh, the two hours that it took to get there the first time but they just finished the 10K twice in the afternoon. They have big news to share. And the first thing out of everybody's mouth is, it's true, the Lord has risen. Simon got to see him. And so, you know, if it had been a celebrity sighting, I suppose it would have been a kind of a letdown, you know, for them to say, oh, well, we saw him too, you know. But, but there's no disappointment. There's, there's no jealousy. There's no one-upmanship. In, this, in our relationship with Jesus, they just, the, the, the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. They just said, yeah, we saw him too. Isn't it awesome? And that's how it is when our relations to Jesus, there's no, there's no, Jesus is infinite. And the more people that glory in him, it doesn't mean that everybody gets a smaller piece of the pie. The pie just never stops growing. And Jesus' presence is infinite. Our joy upon seeing him will be full. And your joy and your joy and yours and yours and yours and all of the people, every Elgin Baptist, their joy will be full. Twin Oaks Presbyterian back in St. Louis. There will be places we've never heard of. When we see Jesus, when we see Jesus, our joy will be full. It will know no bounds at his appearing. Now, by the way, our our oldest son is is, is fine. He, he got over he got over that Christmas, and uh, he's had about thirty thirty five and counting since the since the Great Pony Christmas. Um, <laughs> I think it served as a 
healthy calibration of the nature and ability of Santa Claus. Uh, and in the ensuing years, uh, God himself actually provided friends who had horses countless opportunities to ride. There's a particular ride on a, that he took on a Mustang that's become part of the family lore. Um, he was present for the birth of a, of a foal, uh, and, and he, actually, he actually caught the foal when the mare pushed it out. Uh, there's nothing like a lap full of newborn covered in embryonic fluid to uh, inject a reality into the romance of horse ownership. Um, he takes his beautiful wife and two lovely children to church every Sunday. Our prayer, of course, is for them, is our prayer for ourselves and for you all, that uh, they would continue to seek Jesus with all their hearts as he reveals himself in his word, as he reveals himself in his works. Pray that we would talk him around and share him as he's been shared with us. Uh, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your generosity in Jesus, for revealing himself to us, sometimes, sometimes keeping us from seeing, but always being present, that no matter what, he's ready, he's ready, and he's willing to be known to us. He makes us known in his word. He makes us known in his works. He makes us known in his presence. We thank you for him and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As a band leads us one more time, we want to sing that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Please stand.
receive the Lord's benediction from, that he gave to Aaron in the Old Testament in the wilderness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his, lift up his countenance upon you. I'm sorry. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. Remember to stick around and uh, enjoy the coffee and, and fellowship. Thank you.
was waiting for this to, to pull, to do. 